Hi, this is Nick from Music for the Head and Heart, and I am with John Keenan. Good afternoon to you, John. Good afternoon. And you are my producer, actually, uh, was quoted as saying, I thought I must mention, John Keenan put leads on the map musically. To a large extent, anyway. To an extent. Uh, and there was a, a time when I was the only promoter around because nobody else was, was doing it. Basically, you know, I started put, putting bands on because there were bands I wanted to see that weren't reaching leads. And uh, I put, put some on for myself, really. Yeah. You know, because I wanted to see them. So I thought I'd start off by, as somebody who's uh, done promotion for a long, long time, yeah. and I looked at your website and the list was extraordinary. I mean, for those who have a look at it, you know, just off the top, top, uh, off the top, there's the Police, U2, Human League, Joy Division, New Order, Radiohead, Coldplay, Nirvana, Muse, some lesser known, perhaps people that I love, um, the Beatniks, Fred yeah. Eagle Smith, Roy Harper, John Martin, Steve Earle, it's just endless. Yeah. What makes for a good promoter from your point of view? As somebody who actually loves doing what they do, you know, the, the best promoters uh, are very knowledgeable about music and uh, they have an eclectic taste. You know, I don't, people say to me, what's your favorite kind of music? I've never really joined the pack, you know, on a certain type of music. If it's good of its kind, then it's good to me, you know. Even, you know, pop stuff, uh, I like, oh, that's a good song, it's a good pop song, you know. Yeah. Uh, I don't think, oh, I don't listen to anything if it's not alternative. You know, there's a, what, you know, the uh, indie snobs, I call them, you know. The, <laughs> You know, that really, you know, it, it, when I did the Future Arm Festivals, I used to put references to the past in. The first one I put Hulk with in. Because that was the music you were listening to before you became a punk or before you became indie. You know, and, uh, I, you know, put uh, Gary Glitter on. And, uh, and that way it was the right success. You know, I thought they'll either go for this or they won't. Because 10 years ago, you know, the, the 19, 20 year olds were listening to Gary Glitter. Yeah. And, you know, later on I put basic rollers. That wasn't as successful as uh, Morrissey refused to go on before them. <laughs> it was Smith. Uh, but it was, you know, it was a pretty doomy day. A lot of the goth scene started to come in then. So there were a lot of dark bands on. And uh, I just thought, put some. It, put the base city rollers on for a bit of light, you know, yeah. just something to send people home with a smile on their face. They had some good songs, base city rollers. Still playing, <laughs> apparently, certainly yeah. in name, yeah. so... Yeah, you know, I think Les McHugh is still going. Yeah. yeah. So how's music ch promotion changed since you started, and what do you say, what's the good news, what's the bad news? Well, it's changed completely different. It, it's... Uh, everybody can call themselves a promoter now. All they need to do is put up an event on Facebook and they're a promoter. But, you know, when I started, uh, you had to do posters and flyers. And to save time, I used to do most of my posters and flyers by hand, you know, cut and paste, uh, print stick and uh, letter set and uh, tipex and, uh, you know, uh, and uh, a lot of the time I used to do my flyers in my lunch time uh, and uh, I'd spend a bit longer on some of the posters and then you had to take them to the printers and uh, I didn't like typesetting you know because it just looked ordinary and boring but they still have to be put onto a litho plate mm. or a silver screen you know to print them. The first uh, future armor posters uh, were silk screened uh, I didn't do many of them, so the collector's item was, I think, the fetch over 100 quid a piece. Wow. The originals, yeah. And I know the, the, there's a whole, it's almost, I looked uh, at the, sort of the history of John Keenan, there's like almost yeah. different eras, and Futurama yeah. was definitely something that caught public imagination. What was yeah. the thinking behind that as opposed to when you were doing stuff at the Duchess? Well, basically, uh, I started a, a club. Uh, at the Poly with uh, a guy called Grim Cardi 
and uh, as I said earlier, you know, we, we were basically putting on the bands that we wanted to see, and uh, that lasted through the summer of '77, and uh, then the poly chucked us out of the common room, you know, which is the room we had, and in, in that period, you know, in that common room, I, you know, I put the slits and the police and. Uh, uh, and Spitfire Boys and Slaughter of the Dogs and XTC as well, ah. you know, all of those just in that little common room, just in the space of a few weeks. But when they chucked us out, um, I, I had to look for somewhere else and I found a, a fading cabaret club. It used to be a big cabaret club called the Ace of Clubs, and uh, it was, you know, on its uppers. And so that, you know, they gave me uh, a couple of nights a week, you know, to do something there. And I, I started that in the September, and because we were leaving the poly, uh, I, I put out a leaflet saying, "Let's get the f out of here," you know. <laughs> and uh, you know, that's basically where uh, the f club came from. And uh, I thought, and because we had such a good crowd at the poly, I thought, how can I keep them all together? And that's when I formed. Uh, the membership and gave them a, a, an F Club card and they would get a discount when they come in, the original Poly members. And I still see a lot of them around today. Yeah. Uh, in their 50s and 60s, you know. But, you know, some of them still retain that old punk vibe. And they, a lot of them are very intelligent kids, you know, they, they're very creative and uh, bright. It's just they, they didn't fit in with the normal crowd. Mm. And I think punk. Punk gave them that excuse to, you, you know, the misfits and all that to get together, you know, and then they're not misfits anymore, you know, they're all yeah. part of a big gang. Um, but yeah, um, you know, it was an interesting time for me. Um, you know, I think the first uh, bands I put on at the Ace Clubs were Susie and the Banshees and Wilco Johnson. And, uh, Gang of Four did one of the first gigs there, and Fast Records came down to see them. Mekons, you know, some of the early Leeds University bands. Um, and they just went on from there, just, uh, it, it gathered momentum. And basically the uh, Future Armour Festivals, I'd done about two years of it. And uh, I thought, you know, there's a lot of good bands around Leeds, a lot of you know, bands around here. And so I thought if I put a festival, and the rule of thumb is a festival is as big as its biggest band. Yeah. So I get a couple of bands to agree to headline, put a few bands, middle bands that were just breaking, and then a lot of little bands and give them exposure. Yeah. And but that was the thinking behind it. And the, the working title originally was the world's first science fiction music festival because it was going to combine which stalls selling comics and some uh, films and uh, whatever just to give it a sci-fi theme i dropped that later on but uh, you know it's too complicated to work i had a, had a, a load of films ordered and the british film institute uh, wouldn't give them to me at the last minute because they said there were too many people going to see it that, that you know ah. you could uh, you could only show them to about 100 people at a time or whatever you know. <laughs> I got one or two films and a few slides to show, but uh, yeah, it was all good fun. Well, I know a number of people, including uh, my producer, Carl Rosamond, who's been a long-term producer in Leeds, yeah. was just talking about, I mentioned about interviewing you, and he said, yeah. Future Army, he said, yeah. that was a golden era, yeah. you know, uh, where people still talk about yeah. that, you know, like decades on. Yeah. Did you ever... It was like an endurance test. <laughs> <laughs> two days, you know. I didn't sleep for two days, went straight through. It was like, yeah, it was a bit of an endurance test, but I think people liked it for that, you know, because, you know, some people slept on the floor. They had the option to go out to a hotel, yeah. there, you know, but uh, a lot of them were students, kids with no money, so they just bought a sleeping bag and kids out on the floor amidst the rubbish. And uh, the hall didn't have any skips in it or any any uh, plan, you know, for, for the rubbish or they didn't think there would be any rubbish like after 12 hours, even though all the burger vans or whatever in there were paying the haul, you know, uh, the, you know, they, they uh, so we just 
uh, swept it up into a corner. So by the end of the two days, there was a pile of rubbish in the corner, you know, cans and everything, which the whole charge before, even though it was their rubbish. But that's another story. Well, did you ever have a sense uh, back then with uh, bands like you mentioned? I mean, the Police is a good example. Susie and the Banshees. That decades on, these bands would still be, you know, of that kind of stature and popularity. Well, I didn't really think in that way. You know, I, it, it, you know, I just thought, well, some will make it and some won't. You mm. could see the ones who would make it because. The, they had a kind of aura about them, and you, you think, yeah, you, you know, I could see like Toya, you know, she's a very determined person, and she, yeah, I, I thought, yeah, she's going to make it. You know, uh, uh, Billy Idol, you know, mm. Adam Ant, you know, I thought, yeah, he wants to be a star. You know, you could see it in some of them that they really, really want it. And, uh, you know, but the thing is, once they get it, can they hold on to it? And some yeah. of them did, and some of them didn't. Yeah. The, the ones that are benefited now are the ones who didn't quite make it, but they had a, a cult following. And you're finding that, you know, alternative and punk bands from that era uh, are now pulling more people than they did at that, you know, at the yeah. time uh, in their heyday, you know, because a lot of people, you know, couldn't afford to go and see them then. But all the uh, fans who grown up now and their kids have grown up and they've got spare money and, and they can go out and see the bands that they couldn't see or the parents wouldn't let them see 40 years, 34 years ago. <laughs> Here we go. I'll take it off. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in 65 you were 16 at Southport Art College. Yeah. If you were back then, now, what would you send your advice back to the younger John Keenan in in '65? Um, I'm, I'm not sure, what, you know, whether I would uh, give me any advice because I wouldn't take it anyway. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I just do what I wanted to do. Yeah. You know, I'm not, I'm not very good at being told what to do. You know, so I just, but. I'd, I do things and I, I do them to a reasonable level. I mean, that's the thing. I'm not really good at anything. You know, I'm not talented. I'm slightly above average at some things, you know, uh, but I'm not really good, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm not a really good musician. I'm not a good painter. I'm not a good writer. But I can put it all together and, and uh, make it palatable. Well, I would have to respectfully disagree in terms of your ability to pull together what is an extraordinary number of yeah. uh, artists. I mean, it's uh, live at Leeds, your site? Pardon? Your site? Live in Leeds. Live, live in Leeds. Leeds. Anybody watching this, look at Live in Leeds and prepare to be amazed by the sheer scope and variety of artists. Yeah, it's persistence. That's all. It's stubbornness, persistence. I just keep on going. Um, I can't think of anything better to do. You know, I, when I was uh, a teenager, uh, I think John Lennon made a quote, which was from uh, Mark Twain, I think, uh, which was, um, um, hang on, I've got to get the quote right. Uh, if you find a job that you enjoy doing, you'll never have to work a day in your life. Mm. And I've always gone by that. I've always done stuff I've enjoyed. I've never done it for money. Uh, I've, you know, I've always worked in entertainment, theatre, whatever, because I enjoy doing it. I worked at the Grand Theatre uh, when I was first in Leeds and got paid bugger all, you know. It was mm. like a pittance, but you'd be working 12 hours a day and sometimes you'd be doing a getting through the night, you know, and you'd come out with it you know, about eight quid, you know, for the week. And, uh, but I really enjoyed doing it. And uh, because of that, uh, I uh, got an in to YTV when it opened up. Mm. And, you know, that if you do things for nothing and you enjoy doing it, you, you know, you'll just find other things that you enjoy that you might make a little, make a living out of, 
you know, make a little bit of cash out of it. Yeah. That, that's the way I've lived most of my life. And we talked a little bit on the phone, we were talking about like the head and the heart for certain artists and that uh, some things might uh, are just for the love of doing stuff, which I completely yeah. applaud. I mean, this platform is, is basically out of my love for just corralling artists together in some way. Uh, and then also the head where you have to look at some practical considerations uh, as well. Yeah. Um, what's your, of the promotions and the bands that you've loved over the years, what are the ones that really stand out as moments for you? Uh, I don't like this kind of question because it's different every day. It's like people say, oh, what's your favorite song? What you say? They're different every day. I wake yeah. up with a different head. You know, one day I might want a bit of Motorhead, uh, the next day, Grieg. Right. Or something, you know, it's like, and uh, asking me that, it, you know, there's, there are some standout moments, but there's a lot of them, you know, and, and I, I can't really pick a favourite out of them. Yeah. Or just whatever yeah. for today. Tomorrow, as I yeah. think Neil Young was interviewed once and he yeah. said at the end, bear in mind, tomorrow we may remember it all differently. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, I mean, there are great moments like when when I, I, I put Joy Division on several times um, before they became known and made it and when they played the Future Armour in the Queen's Hall which is a big old tram shed echoey I remember the Queen's uh, and it was dark yeah and they uh, when they played I got them and just thought wow this is a stadium band you know this is like they're, they're not a little club band they're a you know, they're a mm. band you should see, and I just thought, wow, they're, they're going to go places. And then, about six months later, Ian Curtis uh, topped himself, and, and uh, you know, uh, but the band New Order struggled on, you know. And yeah. The, uh, I, I put them on at the F Club, uh, and Rob Gretton, the manager, said, uh, don't mention Joy Division. If you mention Joy Division at all, will pull the shows. So I put on the flyers, if you don't know who they are, don't bother to come. No, so people <laughs> made it, made it their, you know, their aim to sort of find out who it was. Mm. So, yeah. And in the chronological order of things, was Futurama and the Duchess was before Futurama? No, no, it was after. I did, after? I did the last Futurama while I was at the Duchess in 1989 with James and Primal Scream and the I know, and yeah, I know Tim yeah. from James very yeah. well. And Curd and bands like that. But the, uh, yeah, I took over the, uh, I, was at the I was at the Ford Green after the F Club. Right. Uh, put on bands like Bo Diddley and Roy Harper and Dr. Feelgood and Loudon Wainwright and Richie Havens, uh, you know, people like that. And uh, then I was at the Astoria where I put the band, you know, B Leagues and uh, uh, Richard Thomas. The Notting Hill Billies? Yeah, Notting Hill Billies played there. I didn't do that one actually. I left for the Duchess a long time. Right. Um, but yeah, I was doing the Duchess. Um, and, you know, loads. You know, you, you, you know but people say uh, they wanted a blue plaque on the Duchess. And, and it was like the younger people, but for me, the, the better times were. Uh, when the F Club started, and I changed the name to the Fan Club a year later because one or two people were saying, Oh, the F stands for fascist and all that. And so I thought, I'll just make it innocuous and call yeah. it the Fan Club. Yeah. Uh, because at, at that time, the, there was a lot of trouble with the National Front and the NP and all that. Mm. But uh, it was more uh, of a psychological build up, you, you, you know. but. It wasn't pleasant, but you know we dealt with it. We got through yeah. it. You know, I think people gave them a lot more the National Front a lot more importance. But you know, to my mind, the SWP were just bad. Yeah. You know, they were just trying to get young people on their side. And I've never liked uh, factions. I've never liked you know, extremism in any any form. You know, I just like an easy life. You know? <laughs> But, you know, I do stand up for things I disagree with. Well, I know the Duchess. I mean, the Duchess, when I came to Leeds in the early 80s, was just legendary. Everybody um, knew the Duchess. 
Well, you know, any venue uh, is as good as its programming. And basically, I've programmed the Duchess for 12 years. And, you know, I took a risk on a lot of the bands. Uh, and sometimes they got the money back, sometimes they didn't. Uh, you know, the going rate for a first time round band was about £100. But if you only had 10 people in, as in the first time I put Duchess on, I think there were 12 people in. You know, it's still a loss. You got to pay the PA, the, yeah. and the advertisers. You know, periphery costs. But the next time they play, this all play, play sad, So I got the money back, and that—that's the thing. You—you you asked me earlier on about how promotion has changed. In those days, uh, uh, there was an art to promoting. Basically, you picked a band that you liked and, and thought were going somewhere, and you put them on in a small venue, and then when they started to build a crowd, you moved them to a bigger venue. Mm. And then you moved them, after, you know, when they started to fill that one, you moved them up to a bigger venue. It's like building them, you know, so I used to move them up to Tiffany's, which held, held 2,200. And I put bands like Madness, uh, Toy, uh, Altered Images, uh, Birthday Party, lo loads of bands, Stranglers, Squeeze, you know, uh, move them up to to the Tiffany's level and nowadays if you've got a band on a, a fill in a small club the big tour promoters will monitor that watch it and then the, the next time they go out they'll just buy up all the dates from the agent and the provincial promoter misses out on it you know yeah very few of the bands that you've built come back because they they believe it was uh, through their own talents and whatever that they made it they don't understand that a lot of, I'm not talking about just me but a lot mm. of people were behind uh, pushing them up you know to help them take off and uh, you know it would be nice if one or two said oh you know, we were making the big money and said, oh, we'll come back, we'll, we'll do you one. Yeah, it's a few hundred yeah. grand for your help. Well, yeah, they, they get there, you know, they get high and, uh, you know, oh, massive. And then they fall out of favour and then they come back to me and say, oh, John, can you put us on? <laughs> you know, it's, uh, but that's the way it works, you know, I've, I've become accustomed to that. I've made a living just and uh, I'm, I'm very happy at the moment, you know, with what I've got. Well, I'm a massive fan of music connecting people, you know, yeah. part of the reason for this platform is I see like lots of very good artists but with small circles of groups of people and the idea is to yeah. try and create something with a bit more momentum um, and I'm astonished at how talented a lot of people are but also um, the, it's a challenge for them to connect to a, a wider yeah. audience. Well, I think uh, there's a lot of very good musicians now, but they all learn from YouTube, from the internet. They're all learning the same things, you know. And individuality is is, uh, is missing a bit in yeah. a lot of the bands. And you hear some of the young bands, you think, yeah, I know what they've been listening to their dad's record collection or whatever, and they've taken that from there. You know, I can see where they've taken the bit. And I think there's not as many characters coming out. We used to have, you know, in the punk era even, we used to have a, a lot of uh, eccentric British characters, you know, like you know, from John Otway to yes. a Reckless Eric and Jilted John and all that. There's very few of those kind of characters coming out. And I think it's some of the humour is missing. We don't have like novelty number ones, yeah. you know, uh, like shut up your face and <laughs> all that, you know. I think the last novelty I can remember was the Crazy Frog, you know, about yes. 10 years ago. But yeah, we don't have uh, much of that. And, uh, and it is all very slick and professional, but sometimes it misses out on the character. I, I could not agree more. I mean, I, I grew up in an era where there was top, I missed Ready Steady Go, but Top of the Pops, yeah. so that was it. And then um, there was no MTV, yeah. so there were very 
very different, you know. And now, um, if I look at a lot of me, I go, yeah, they've been listening to X, Y, Z. Yeah. yeah. And you know, I remember seeing, I think it was Tom Waits playing Small Change on the Old Bray Whistle Test, yeah. thinking, what is this? You know, small change got wasted with an old 45 or something like that, yeah. You know, um, and I think um, I'm a big fan of that originality where people have got a voice and certainly things where you go, I don't know what to make of this, rather than, yeah, it's another person who's been listening to this. Yeah. Um, so what, for people who are watching... Talking about, I tend to think that somebody like Tom Waits would make it on The X Factor or whatever. You know, and now the X Factor seems to be turning out clones yes. of each other. And, uh, to, uh, Sam Cow tries to get trendy, you know, like he gave one them the, the X Factor song Hallelujah, you know, which made a lot of money for Cohen just before he died. Yeah. But uh, it, it misses the mark a lot of the time. I, I watch it, I, you know, it's interesting to see what's coming through. But most of them, you know, like they started off in karaoke and. Yeah, got it down to a T, and it's not coming from, as a fr from the heart or the mind. You know, it's just coming because they've learned it. And also, I think there's a lot of emphasis on the backstory. You know, yeah. uh, uh, you know, um, where for me, I'm interested in things that pro yeah. pro yeah. provoke, and in, even if I, I don't particularly like it, I just go, but it's something about it that's interesting. Yeah. Um, so for people who are watching this, sort of like the aspiring bands that are looking at YouTube, and they want, they want in 2019, God, um, what's simple advice that's good for people in this day and age? I think uh, work towards a distinct sound uh, and try and find your own character. I mean, it's cliche. All the cliches find your own voice. Yeah. You know, do. But yeah, it, it, you know, it, it, it rings true now. You know, the, you know, going back to the '60s, uh, you know, the Beatles just had when they first came, it had a, they had a fresh sound, and they were singing in uh, their own accents. They weren't trying to be American or anything else, and and their chord changes, you know, were different mm. from the norm. You know. And uh, you just, yeah, this is, you thought this is something different. And then you go through, you know, like uh, Bob Dylan, Neil Young, Leonard Cohen, all them through the 60s, and the girl singers, you know, Lulu, uh, Scylla Black, Dusty Springfield. You know, they were the pop stars, but they had uh, different voices. They had, as soon as you heard it on the radio, oh, that's Dusty Springfield. That, you could tell the voice straight away. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's what to look for, you know. I find a lot of the pop songs now, they're all overproduced and all. They use vo voice auto-tune, you know. And uh, they all start to sound the same and they use you know, the same kind of backing. And, yeah, I'm sounding like an old man, but uh, I, you know, I, I, I would like to see Top of the Pops come back because that, you know, gave you a variety so your grandparents could watch it and you see something new that your grandparents would say, oh, that's horrible, I can't stand that, you know. And uh, when they said that, you knew that's going to make it. <laughs> but you know, Top of the Pops was a great level, you know? yeah. and, uh, and, you know, I'm sorry that it's gone because I don't think there's anything like it. At the moment. Well, I remember um, Alice Cooper on Top of the Pops, David Bowie, and this was considered to be outrageous. Yeah, it's like almost yeah. civil unrest, Sorry, yeah. you know. Um, lock up your daughters, you know. This this whole period of what's um, he wearing? Oh, look at his hair. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's good, you know. It's something for the family to discuss, and the kids always wanted the rebellious ones. You know. Yes. But now you, you know you get niche programs, you know, dedicated to a certain genre and all that. Uh, I, I suppose the nearest is uh, to Top of the Pops is Jules Holland's later, but it's probably too cool for school then. Yeah. You know, I think you need a good mix. I, I could not agree more. Yeah. I could not agree more. You brought some flyers and things. It'd yeah. be interesting to sort of have a, a nose at seven. Yeah. That was the first gig I did in Leeds. Um, 
uh, as you can see, it's a hand-up uh, poster, but uh, basically I, I rang the agent, I wanted Lou Reed, I wanted to put Lou Reed on, and he wouldn't give me Lou Reed, he said, but I've got Alan Price, and I, I thought, and, and, you know, I didn't really want to do it, but it was like a baptism of fire, I thought, well, I'd better take it, and I put my mate Time and Dog on to open up, and he was like, he, he actually taught Joe Strummer to play, and he used wow. to go out busking with Joe Strummer, and so he's a bit of a punky folk singer, and uh, I think he opened a few eyes. Uh, interesting. I, I lost lost about two or three hundred quid on it. You know, a lot of money, which well, is a fair amount. Uh, but you know, they're all kinds of extra charges, you know, that they add on with these holes. Um, but yeah, it was a start, and it got me into it. You know. Let's see who we have. Here, um, oh, wow. the heartbreakers, the vibrators. Yeah, that's Unity Hall Wakefield. You know that I, I, when it, in those days I did Leeds Poly and uh, Wakefield Unity Hall, and the heartbreakers are Johnny Thunder's uh, ex Walter Law ex New York Dolls, um, and that moved on to uh, to the. Uh, Stars of today at Leeds Poly. The Police. Yeah, and the, the Slits. And this was nineteen seventy-seven. Nineteen seventy-seven. So this would be first Police album. Yeah, they yeah. just uh, had Roxanne out. It was, it, they actually made it when the Roxanne came out in the states, and Roxanne was hit in the states before it was hit in Britain. So. Wow. The, you know, then they, they were not known. Oh, and here we are, Wilco Johnson That's about. At the Ace of Clubs, yeah. <laughs> Who's still going strong? No, the Ace of Clubs. Oh, the Wilco. Oh, Wilco yeah. is, yeah, yeah. He, he had a hiccup a few years ago, you know, with cancer, but uh, he, uh, he managed to get out of it. The Boontown Rats, Sham, I remember in, I uh, lived in Weybridge and Jimmy Percy used to work in a local Wimpy bar and served me in the, in the early 70s before he was the singer of Sham 69. So well, this, they're, they're still going. Still going? Yeah. Well, let's have a, this is fascinating. And I remember these, were these ones that you drew? These? Yeah, yeah. Because these were always shy, yeah. very, and the lunch hour when you were working? Uh, YTV. YTV. Yeah. So early ones, I'm trying to think. Find the, yeah, that, that was the first one at Brannigan's. I moved from Roots in Chapel Town to, um, to Brannigan's. And the only ones? Pardon? The only yeah, ones yeah. as well. Well, there's, uh, I think there's Joy Division in there supporting pair. No, uh, Cabaret Voltaire. Let's have a look. Somewhere like that. And, uh, the tiny little, okay, yeah. Ultravox. Uh, yeah. Fascinating. I think it's it. Um, so are these your original drawings? Yeah, yeah. yeah the, you know, I did them all. Wow. I've always done them. All, all my artwork. Uh, as I say, I'm not not very good. I didn't do graphics. I did fine art when I was at art school. So uh, I, I just ended up doing graphics. When I'm a painter, really at art, but you know, I just for those of us who are around in the seventies, particularly, it, it is literally like a who's who of yeah. bands. Um, you know, you sort of look and you just go, yeah, you've got specials. The, the Taurus with Echo and the Bunny Men supporting, and Adam and the Ants, UK subs. The Revillas. B-52s. That was the first Future Armour Festival. Wow. Hawkwind, the only ones, the four Scritti Politti, Echo and the Bunny Men, Teardrop Explodes. Nobody had heard of the bands at that time. They'd, you know, they'd played the club, and you know, that's why I put them on. 
absolutely fascinating. Killing, so anything killing in, joke. Killing joke. Yes. Oh, bad so manners. So there was a big Scarface, you know, specials, bad manners, uh, selector, no deaths, you know, all that kind of stuff. Like body snatches. I think it's great that you kept all of these because I can remember these um, posters yeah. from way, way back. Yeah, uh, then I did a bit of the warehouse, you know, Blue Orchids, Depeche Mode, Orange Juice. Wow. Here we go. So here we've got Futurama 3. Yeah. And this is New Bingley. Yeah. All in Stafford, yeah. Oh, okay, in Stafford. Yeah, basically, uh, the second feature on was successful, and uh, by the time uh, I'd come to book for the following year, London promoter John Kerr got in, and because uh, only took you know took it, booked the dates in September. You know, I've done two. The, the first one lost a bit of money. The second one made money. Realised that, and he even ripped off the, the name. He called it Days of Future Past. You know, future mm. uh, and use some of the same bands, so I moved it to Stafford. That's uh, absolutely fascinating. And I, I have been to some of these guys, <laughs> stranger, yeah. I have been to some of these gigs. I saw Loud and Wainwright yeah. uh, at Ford. Um, Creek, more than yeah. likely saw Roy Harper there. And John Cooper Clark. And John Cooper Clark, who is still yep. alive still and going, yeah. going. He's not put on any weight yep. in all these years. Yes. <laughs> I have. <laughs> <laughs> yes, me too. And the Ford Green, the Ford Green period was... It was early 80s. Early 80s. Yeah. So this is post Duchess? Uh, post F Club. Post F Club. Fan Club at Brannigan's. Then Ford Green and then the Astoria, and in the meantime, I did places like the uh, the Trades Club. Right. Um, people like the Last Poets on that. That's, I'm missing a bit of that period uh, in terms of flyers because I don't know. Uh, I missed some of the early flyers because I had a a, a flood in my cellar, so everything got down. And uh, and I, I've missed some of the ones from the mid 80s uh, and probably had a similar accident or something but I can't find any of them. Wow, Nico. Yeah, yeah I put Nico on quite a few times. And yeah, I just watched that film, uh, uh, film about Nico. It's terrible. I mean it had good reviews but it was nothing like her, it was nothing like Alan White's used to manage it. It was all a bit made up. You know, yeah. The, uh, I forget what it was called, but it's film about Nico. <laughs> well, she was definitely um, individual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's, you know, I, I stayed, you know, where she used to stay in Brixton. Because uh, Alan Weiser, manager, was a friend of mine. He managed Cooper Clark at one spot, mm. and you, you knew all the what point, and. Uh, he uh, he had a, a, a flat in Brixton where John Cooper Clark and Nico used to stay, and other, other visiting musicians. And I stayed there once. And, uh, I remember being interviewed by an American journalist, and he said, "How would you like to be remembered, Nico?" And she said, "By a tombstone." And everybody was like, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> she, had, she had that way of speaking, which. The actress who played it in the film didn't quite yeah. get, you know, it's kind of it was a, a, a dry humour, but sometimes there was seriousness to it. She wasn't a, a, a very friendly, she, you know, she was like, she kept uh, like a sheet of glass between her, yes. uh, you know, all the time. But I remember the last gig I did was after the story, and uh, at the end she came up to me and said, why don't they come and see me? I will be dead soon. You know, wow. And, uh, you know, about six months later, she was. She, she was in a beater on a health kick, riding into town on a bike, and she fell off. All those years of yeah. rock and roll, yeah. and then you die on a, on a yeah, bike. Yeah, bike in a beater. Yeah. So, these, uh, so fast forwarding to 2019, you're still yeah. promoting, yeah. and currently. 
Yeah, well, you know, I'm, I'm in my seventies now, and uh, obviously I'm slowing down. Uh, so, you know, I, I I don't do as many gigs. Uh, you know, uh, the little bit of money I make, I put towards holidays that go away. Mm. You know, I like to see some of the places I couldn't go and see when I was bringing kids. Up. I've got four children and five grandkids. And wow. So alongside, you know, a lot of promoters don't have that. You know, they they concentrate. So it's I've been married twice, mind you. It's a difficult. Uh, it's difficult to hold a relationship when you're out two or three times a week mm. until two in the morning, you know, and then, you know, at one spell, you know, I was doing the club till two in the morning and then working in Emmerdale at seven in the morning, you know, so there was w one point in my life when I was burning the candle at both ends, yeah. you know, around the f times of the future, aren't we? but that seems to help. The more I did, the more energy I got to do yeah. things. But now, you know, I don't have that energy. I don't. That's the thing about getting old. You know, I've had a quadruple heart bypass. And, wow. And uh, one or two other things. And they tend to slow you down a bit. And all this starts to come up. Well, I'd like to thank you for all the extraordinary music. I mean, personally and also on behalf of other people, because there are in li liveinleeds.com. Yeah. Um, the catalogue of bands and the sheer variety of bands is extraordinary. I mean, everybody from John McLaughlin to Loudon Wainwright to Kate Rusby. Um, well, basically, uh, I like to make people happy, and if if people are happy, I'm happy. You know, that's it's a very simple philosophy. You know, just put you know put out things that people enjoy. You know, don't live off other people's grief, you know, I, I absorb the grief so that people can enjoy the show, you know, that, that's what a promoter's job is. Well thank you so much right. for dropping by, it's been absolutely fascinating uh, looking at some of this old information, but just getting the, the story of connecting up so many different people with so many different bands, uh, many of which um, I know people, friends of mine in Leeds, say, we would never have heard of this band if John hadn't yeah. taken the chance and brought them into it. Yeah. Well, also there's an element of people trusting your judgment, you know, and, uh, and you know, if people think, if, if John Keenan's putting it on, they must be good, you know, that I've already got a, a psychological advantage, you know, yeah. that's it, you know, plus I, I, I'm very social, I see a lot of people say, you must come and see this band. Yeah. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, there's one I've got on uh, called Mark Mulcahy, who's in a band called Miracle Legion and Polaris. But he's uh, he's probably too left field. He's like one, one of the originators of Americana, Americana as it is now. Uh, that's not selling very well. Um, but you win some, you lose some. Yeah. yeah, that's it. And sometimes, you know. Uh, people's uh, choice is not the same as yours, you know, as in <laughs> Fred Eaglesmith. Well, I think if it, my idea of the perfect festival would probably have about 30 people come to it. Um, but uh, thank you so much for, for doing this interview. It's, it's an absolute pleasure talking to you. No and, um, you know, I, I want people to have a look at uh, liveinleeds.com. Yeah, and see. I don't, you know, don't, don't, I don't flog it. It is old fashioned. I, you know, I built it 20 years ago. Yeah. But basically, I hadn't touched the computer till I was 52. Yeah. And I thought, I've got to get into this game. And I went to night school for about six months and I built a website. I've not really done much to it since. So a lot of people say, oh, you need to update your website. I said, yeah, I'll get around to it. But yeah, I'm not a favorite. You know, I can work my way around a computer, yeah. work my way around Facebook, I can put publicity out. But when it comes to building websites, uh, that's for the kids. Yeah. Well, there's plenty of people who can build websites, yeah. but there's not many people who can sort of bring together literally hundreds of bands uh, to literally hundreds of thousands of people. So I think. Um, you may say I'm no expert at one particular yeah. thing. I'd respectfully disagree with that. And uh, thank you for all the uh, input you've had in bringing these bands to uh, public awareness.
Thank you.